Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the Apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the Apocalypse Engine. I'm your MC, Rich, and I'm joined by my guests, Brendan Conway and Mark Diaz-Truman of Magpie Games. Hey, Brendan and Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, Rich. Hey, Rich. Now, both of you guys are returning guests, and so we're going to have to ask something different. <laughs> Normally, I start off with what got you into gaming. We already know that, so we don't want to repeat. Oh no! You guys don't. You, you can't. You can't coast. We, we got to dig deep today. Yeah. Get on the hot seat, yeah. Brendan. You go first. What PBTA game is out there that you didn't make and you most want to play? Ooh, good question. You notice I didn't mm. say and haven't played. Right. So you can answer this however you want. You can remix it if you want. Okay. Well, there's an obvious one to pander to the person on my right, but... <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's, like, worse than you just saying yeah, somebody else's Yeah, game. no, it's bad. It's, it's, it's just bad. terrible. It's bad. Of Let, all, when I say you board. didn't make, maybe I go Magpie Games didn't make? <laughs> Honestly, I think um, I'm intrigued and in love with the playbooks for The Veil. Uh, I haven't gotten a chance to play it ever, uh, so... I don't have a good gauge on it yet, but just flipping through those playbooks was really exciting. All of them had these really neat ideas. The art was really cool. Mm -hmm. And some friends of mine recommended it for some of those mechanics it had around, uh, you know, how your emotional state is the crux of which stat you're rolling. And so that's definitely one that's been on my radar for wanting to try for a while. And I just haven't been able to yet. Very cool. Very cool. Frasier will be super excited to hear that. (laughs) Mark, you can't steal Brendan's answer. Mark, what's your answer, sir? What is the PBTA game that Magpie hasn't made that you most <laughs> want to play? Uh, I actually want to play Legacy Second Edition. I haven't played. Ooh, I haven't played First yeah. Edition either. But I'm part of the Legacy Second Edition Google Plus group, and everybody's questions in that group are like a language I don't speak, right? But they're really interesting <laughs> questions. So people keep coming like, what do you do about this situation? I'm like, that situation sounds awesome. I have no idea what that has to do with the game, but like, that sounds great. So there's a whole bunch of people playing it and they seem really excited and I would like to see what it's about. Yep. I love it. I love it. That's another game that I've backed on Kickstarter. So yeah, pretty cool. All right. Well, guys, you, you passed and now I will allow you on. <laughs> This is like a like the the bridge like a like the, the exactly. rich, rich is the three the, no five sir five. The, orc, the orc that lives under the bridge that go what name a PBTA <laughs> game that you love but have not yet played. <laughs> what is your favorite color? All right, let's go over here and read a sitch. Read a sitch. With Zombie World, the game that we're going to talk about in a little bit, seems like the perfect time for us to talk about for read a sitch. Maybe mortality and the cessation of playing a character. It seems appropriate for uh, a zombie world episode. So let's talk about it. You know, there are a lot of games out there in the PBTA world that actually incorporate death. There are mortality moves for Night Witches and Impulse Drive Uh and Star Wars World. And uh, there's that Urbane Shadows, I think, has something along the lines. <laughs> Urbane Shadows, yes. <laughs> that refined game. Yeah. It's funny, Big, because the, the end moves were in there before I really started working on the mechanics with Andrew. When we first started doing Urban Shadows, I was just kind of this like outside consultant, and I got drawn in more and more by what he was doing. But I thought it was so fascinating. I was like, how often do characters die? Is that even a thing that happens in this game? Because in Apocalypse World, you basically your first bullet's free, and it's it's pretty tough to kill a character. Like, it takes a lot of sort of concerted effort. It's true. But what we found it did in Urban Shadows was give people a sense of, like, it just say it's like a door. It's like the door is labeled death, and maybe you want to walk through it because the end move gives you an excuse to say, it gives you some knowledge as a player of what's on the other side. Ironically, I think in all my PBTA designs, death, like Cartel, has a, a pretty... Death is a very common outcome for a session of cartel for one or more PCs to die. And in Zombie World, it's like very, very common for, <laughs> for us to lose a PC. And like halfway through a session and have somebody make a new PC right there on the spot. And it's one of the, the goals of the game was to have character generation be fast enough that you could lose a PC in the first 20 minutes of play and be like, oh, that was the cold open. My character was in the cold open and now my real character will be here for the rest of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. So, Brendan, what are your thoughts on mortality? And uh, you also, like, another thing we can lean in towards a little bit is is with that mortality and discovering what the main cast is. 
Yeah, part of the complexity of introducing mortality into a game is this notion that my character could be taken away from me. Right. And so it's interesting that Mark puts the Urban Shadows move specifically as walk through a door, because that makes clear that there's this element of choice to it. And not always it's possible you'll arrive at a situation in which there is no choice. Yeah. But a lot of the time it's going to wind up being, I allow this to happen. Uh, I choose in Apocalypse World not to mark a debility and therefore my character dies. Mm -hmm. uh, in Masks, it's pretty much not really in the cards to even lose your character via death without your consent. It's just something that happens so incredibly rarely. And a lot of that is tied up in the fact that these characters are the protagonists. That when you made them, we sort of promised... These are going to be the main cast. We aren't going to rob mm -hmm. you of a main cast member without warning. Uh, who are we, Joss Whedon? Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> we actually had a Masks playtest that I, my character died, and it was because Brendan was GMing and said, well, you can get what you want and at your character's death. And I was like, done, right? But part of that was I also knew it was a superhero game, so I kind of exactly. thought, like, but not really though, right, man? Like, right, I, like. I'm just going to go away for a while and then, like, I think it's come back, right? Yeah. Like, uh, uh, hold on. Yeah. Death is permanent in comics. <laughs> See, Winter Soldier, also Jean Grey, Superman, uh, Wolverine. The man himself, Superman, yeah. Uh, Superman. But I thought that's my right. character's death, quote unquote, would be meaningful for the group. And I could right. be wrong, but it felt right at the time, but I totally chose it, right? Right. Was, Here's the door, you have to walk through it. Right. And so a game that instead makes death more a function of the mechanics or uh, an outgrowth of actual play, not a pure choice, also has the side effect of taking away that guarantee that this character you made is one of the main characters of the show. Exactly as Mark said it, like that's the simplest possible way to understand it is suddenly you discover your character was just in the cold open and in the cold open they died. And that's okay, because, like, that's fine. They, that happens. Like, there are characters in the zombie shows who just, just, just die. They just die. That's it. Um, and over the course of seeing what actually comes out of it, this produces the effect of we discover who the main cast is instead of deciding who the main cast is. It turns out that this character that we all kind of thought was, like, doomed because they're, they're an accountant and they're timid. And they have no survival skills for the zombie apocalypse. Suddenly, they're the one that actually survives yeah. over and over and over. And they turn out to be, if any, the single protagonist of our story. Uh, and that level of discovery is a whole brand new element of playing to find out that we are trying to bring to zombie world. It's ironic because there's actually one of the big inspirations for it is a non-zombie media, mm -hmm. which is Lost. Mm -hmm. On Lost, you have this huge cast of characters, and it's immediately of like, yeah, sure. So there's these these people like who are famous, and so they're on the show, and you know they're going to kind of matter. Mm -hmm. But there are also characters who like get blown up in the middle of an episode, and you're like, I guess that guy doesn't matter, and we're done with him. He's died. We're going to move on, and the cast is going to shift and change, but the community is what actually matters. Right. right, the whole colony, the the group of survivors as a whole is what matters. Yeah, and it's interesting to put it in contrast with Cartel. Where in Cartel, if you get shot, you might get die. But every other situation, including getting shot at, which is kind of a little bit of GM discretion, just has you mark stress. Mm -hmm. But there are right. some times where we declaim responsibility. Yep. What we've done with Zombie World is declaim responsibility always. Yes. Right? It's not up to us as the GM if you get bit. The, the cards tell us when you get bit. Mm -hmm. And when you get bit, you decide how to react. And in Jason Cordova's case... You might manage to go like a whole session without telling anybody you've been bit by lying to people repeatedly <gasps> about whether you were bit. <laughs> so good. And covering it up, right? Like so that's like that's a that's a viable strand of play that I've seen Jason as a pretty pretty solid role player do for an entire set. The whole table knows you've been bit yep. out of character, but in character we're gonna discover it in play. Yep. That's so dastardly. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> What's interesting to me is that I'm, I'm going to sidestep a little bit. Sure. I don't think sex ever happened in an RPG that I played until Apocalypse World when there have, happened to be a move at the table. Yeah. Mm hmm. Right? And so fixing a death 
mechanic, a death move, even the death move in Grimworld. It becomes a thing that is, in a way, rewarding to the group, and it's fun, in a way? Like, it, do you think it gives more permission for that to happen, or more of a reward for, for that to happen? Well, that, that depends on the game, right? I mean, for Zombie World, in some ways it's a reward, because we know someone's going to get bit, and we're playing zombie fiction in particular. It's not just post-apocalyptic fiction or survivor fiction. We, we chose as a group to play a game where getting bit is part of the fun, right? Um, but for Cartel, I think it gives us permission to end character stories with a bang yeah. to say like you're not going to go out just because you got in a car crash you're probably going to stumble away from that with a maxed out stress track but when you face down the big boss and you try to shoot him and you don't <laughs> his guys <laughs> open fire on you one of the outcomes is we might declaim responsibility about your character's future right, right. And mm -hmm. everybody's bought in it's permission to let your character go right like it seems heavily a combination of both in, in nearly every game in that uh, simultaneously I can say to myself as a player this game clearly has signaled to me death is on the table there are rules that accommodate it that make it something real so I can take actions that I wouldn't in another game where death is somehow this it feels more like a wall like, yeah. like a thing I should avoid or a thing that is unaccounted for and therefore, I'm going to instead try never to actually reach that moment. Mm. So one of the effects, for instance, in Zombie World is knowing that death is on the table sometimes has the effect of people playing it carefully and trying to hold on to it. But other times has the effect of people being like, yeah, I mean, my character dies, they die. I'm going to go ahead and take this crazy action and because it's cool and it kind of fits and it's exciting and <laughs> I died. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, but it happens and it's fine because the game is supporting me in this moment instead of just saying, cool, you're back to square one. Like, there, there is zero accounting for this beyond start everything over again. At level one. At level one, yes. <laughs> well, and this has a role to play with the fruitful void, right? So if you're, if you're not familiar with the phrase, the idea is that there's rules and then there's the stuff that's not in the rules. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about the sex moves, and I think this is often really maligned around Apocalypse World, we, uh, we sometimes hear people say, that's the game with the weird sex stuff or whatever. The irony is the sex moves are really pretty mild. They're like, oh, you have sex and then you get to give somebody one barter for free. Cool. Plus right? one forward. Plus one forward, right? It's one that's like, their sex move doesn't work. <laughs> like this, it's not exactly like really gripping, like dynamic fiction. It's just there. But like you said, Rich, once it's there, it's like this door. And then all the play between where you are in the door is the void. It's like, are you going to angle for the sex move? Do you want to say, hey, out of character, I'm kind of angling for a sex move here. Are you cool to play a scene where we see if that happens? Or are you like, oh, God, a sex move. I'm going to stay away from that because my mm -hmm. sex move's terrible. I, I'm the vampire. <laughs> I leave you in a terrible spot when I have the sex move, right? So let's get away from that, right? But the void is created by the rule. But it, the game doesn't tell you how to have sex. Right. right. The game doesn't say, oh, roll this, then roll this, then roll that, and the other characters will sleep with you. It just says... Hey, if you if you sleep together, this is what happens. This is, what happens. This is this is the thing. Nice. I, you pulled the vampire from my brain. Like, yeah, that how. sex move is no good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and then, and again, back to Urban Shadows. You know, I, before I really dug into the project, Andrew had already selected to do intimacy moves, and that's because in urban fantasy fiction, sex happens for sure, but there's also a lot of like. The two of us are alone in the library and I confess that I murdered my brother when I was 10 and that's why I'm a wizard because he died and they took me away and we want that moment to feel super intimate and meaningful. Mm -hmm. So something ha that, that, and we have to encourage people to get there, right? And it was like, cool, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Anything else you guys want to talk about uh, mortality and discovering your party after a few people <laughs> die? I would, I would say that like, so having run, you know, a lot of games over the course of my life and a lot of different systems. I mean, I think character death is something that really is not well thought out in most systems because it is seen as a failure state. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things we're trying to do at zombie world is give people death as not a failure state, but as something else. And I think mm -hmm. it's always, I think it's always silly to ask designers to speak to like the entirety of their design. Like, but, but why is this important person who built this thing? Right? Like, I don't know. I just, we fucking did it. Right. But like, like there is some part of us with the way the rest of the game is designed around trying to give you an opportunity to care about the characters in the colony 
beyond your own character without getting into like an Ars Magica, like playing 17 people thing, right? right? We want you playing one person at a time, right? but we want you to be able to let go of that person when that person's time is up and like have that be a reward that you get a new character and a new vector and a new engagement with the fiction. Yeah. I, secondarily to that, there's that interesting effect of seeing because of this accommodation for the death and for it not being a failure state, it changes a lot of the relationships between characters, it changes mm-hmm. the relationships between player and character. I can be like, I am perfectly content playing a villain, AKA the governor, yeah. because if I die, that's actually still kind of this really cool story beat. And I'll just get a new character and come back into it and everything's fine and great. And I don't have to make sure I'm playing a character I am happy to play forever. forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good point. Right, you're not like, oh, I guess I was a cannibal before and, and stuff, and I left that colony. I'm glad I'm playing this character for the next two years. We sit here and play this game over 17 sessions. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Before we end, though, you now have, like, I'm on a mission to make you guys have a stretch goal for Ars Magica so we can have zombie grogs. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just look. We'll, we'll, That's it. I'm already a backer, so I'm just going to be putting some comments in there. <laughs> they're not delete them. Doesn't, I'm going to take screenshots. Right. Isn't there a new Ars Magica coming? We'll see if we do some sort of cross promotion. Yeah. We'll be like, yeah, there, no. there you go. Yeah, it's an Ars Magica cross promotion with a RPG card game. Zombie <laughs> Magica? Ars <laughs> Zombies? <laughs> Ars <laughs> Magica? Exactly. You guys got me hyped about Zombie World, uh, so let's jump over here and learn a little bit more about that specifically. Let's open our brain to it, and then and then suck out the marrow. Suck out <laughs> brains. Open your brain. Zombie World is currently on Kickstarter at the time that this podcast comes out. It's already fully funded. I'm really excited for everybody to learn a bit more about this game. You guys have been making it for a while, so this, this is this is super cool. I remember I got a chance to play it at Origins Games on Demand a couple of years ago. So congratulations for getting the sucker out there. Thank you. Thank you, man. What is the setting of Zombie World, and what's it about? So we set our scene in February, no, uh, about six months <laughs> after... Z day, you know, the day the zombies arose, and time is a little bit fuzzy, right? Nobody's exactly keeping tight track of how long it's been, and we're not really worried about the exact circumstances of how everything fell, because the bottom line is everything has fallen. You're living in a fallen world, but you still remember the life you left behind. You remember how wonderful it was to just have those simple amenities you took for granted while you are living in a prison with none of those amenities. Uh, we, we center around an enclave, and you'll have a choice of several different enclaves. The core game comes with two. Our expansions offer more. We've unlocked some of stretch goals. And, and your enclave will basically be a core setting for the game. So I, I mentioned the prison. Uh, your prison is like, we took over a prison, and we transformed it into the place we are trying to make a new home and somehow make survivable. That will tell us some of the specific things we can choose from for our setting. But everybody's enclave is going to be a little bit different. If I choose that we have a scarcity of weapons, and you choose in your game that you have an armory, well, that's obviously going to play fairly differently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a lot of it is determined at the start of play for the specifics uh, of the situation you and your characters are encountering. The Enclave is also a sort of representation of the hope that I think Zombie World characters intrinsically have that the world might be made right again, right? And so one of the things about this is we call it zombie apocalypse fiction because it's not post-apocalypse. The apocalypse is ongoing, right? And you are in the middle of it. Uh, and the goal with the, the Enclaves is to give people like a playbook for them to experience the world through the eyes of people who live in a prison or people who went to the mall, <laughs> <laughs> or people who load all their shit in caravans and try to go find a safe place like our first stretch goal. Um, so the enclave is really the center of the game and your characters interface with it by believing a little bit in that colony and that potential for a future. Oh man, that's, that's so dope. I really <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay, well, what are the mechanics about Zombie World that are different Versus, say, Apocalypse World. I come in from Apocalypse World. Okay, fine. It's Apocalypse World, but with zombies. Great, right? That's all I need to know, right? I mean, 
it's powered by the apocalypse in the sense that it uses a lot of the same relationships between the players and the fiction. We as the GMs, in this case, will tell you this is what's happening and you tell us what you do. And that's that's what how the game plays. And when you hit a move, we make the move and you draw cards instead of rolling dice. But you don't have a playbook. You have three cards that tell you who your character is. First, you have a past, which is the card that tells you who you were before Z-Day. Then you have a present. You'll choose between two for this when you make your character. That's the role you play in the colony now. Mm -hmm. Then you have a trauma, which is your internalized reaction to the fall of society. So, for example, for a past, you might have taxi cab driver. You drove taxi cabs. That's it. You don't get to choose that card. It's randomly assigned to you because your past is your past. It's gone. You didn't get to choose it. It happened to you. Your present might be a choice between an enforcer and a cook. You might be the kind of person who roughs folks up for the bosses of the enclave, or you might be the person who prepares food for everybody. Your choice. At some point, you made that choice, right, in in your past, and you've arrived at this present role. And your trauma might be something like overbearing, like you just have reacted to the the zombie apocalypse by getting involved in everybody's business. Or it could be something really terrible, something that would let you hurt other people in the colony and get benefits for it. Your past and your trauma start face down. Only your present starts face up, including to the GM, (laughs) which means that your past and your trauma are yours and yours alone. I don't know what they are. The other players don't know what they are. And as the game evolves, you might choose to reveal them or trigger a reveal of them in the case of the past. But we don't know who your character is. We're going to find out as we play at a totally different level than just a playbook, right? Like, I literally don't know what your past was. The characters we meet, the relationships you form they will be ignorant of that past until you choose to reveal it. I adore that the GM doesn't know. That reminds me of uh, The Mountain Witch. It's the first time where I yeah. encountered a thing of like, oh, my dark fate. And uh, Arnold Cassell was running the game and he said, uh, I know I'm not going to look at the card. We're going to play through. And uh, then you reveal it when it's appropriate. And that was electrifying. <laughs> it, was, it was exciting, right? It allows the GM to be kind of a player in a way yeah. to be surprised so that's really cool i think that's a that's a good choice and for us like one of the reasons that the game has taken a long time to develop is it took us a long time to arrive at these just need to be cards like we've tried you draw from a deck of cards and you do a thing on your phone and you do this and you do that like it took us a long time to say no you just need to get a card that says you're a tyrant mm-hmm. that's it like <laughs> and every card has a move on it so you're kind of dynamically generating a playbook on the fly a lot of this has development for us has been living up to that right very cool so this one's going to be a tough one but i'm going to ask it and you're going to interpret it as you will what is your favorite move and why i know there are a lot of moves in here because like you said every card has a move but what's your favorite one <laughs> well uh i call out our make a plan move uh which i greatly enjoy because it does a number of things it speeds up the fiction it allows you to do that thing where supposedly we'll come together and we'll figure out what we're going to do before we go and look for supplies we'll, we'll actually plan it out while also making that really quick and simple and easy at the table. And it has the neat effect of often resulting in you get to the middle of your plan and something terrible happens and you're caught in a dangerous situation. And it, it's a move we put in there because the number of times people would make a plan and would say, yeah. uh, we're going to go do the thing. We need medicines. So we're going to go to the hospital. We're going to go very carefully. We're going to go in a car. You're going to be the lookout. And that would eat up a bunch of time just to figure out those details. Now with this move, we punch straight through and we get to these exciting things, just like you would imagine in your zombie TV show, in your zombie movie, uh, the moment the plan goes awry. The moment that somebody steps on a floorboard and it breaks and it reveals the basement of the pharmacy is full of zombies. And oh no. Oh, no, now they're breaking through the floor. Oh, God, oh, God, run, 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 run. <laughs> it, it obviously has some uh, Blades in the Dark DNA there with the engagement role, right? But but instead of heist fiction, the zombie fiction is kind of this unqualified people trying to get a thing done. <laughs> As opposed to Blades, where it's overqualified people trying to get something done. Here with, with zombie fiction, it's like we get in our truck and we drive there and we do our best to avoid being seen. But we're accountants and doctors and whatever, and we're just going to do our best. 
Um, and so like Brendan says, it, it jumps us to the part of that fiction we want to see. Um, yeah, I I really like Make a Plan because that, that's the part of Shadowrun that kills me. Yeah, <laughs> the two hour planning session for yeah. the for the job. Yeah, yeah, it, for sure. yeah. It also has these perfect little pieces to where we ask, for instance, is there significant disagreement about which plan to follow? No. Yes. No. Oh, oh, oh. So yes, there so is. Yes. <laughs> so yes, there is. <laughs> Got it. Uh, it reminds me of like in masks when you say does everyone have exactly. the same plan yeah, yeah. and and everyone kind of nods and i go okay well exactly what do you think your plan is and they explain it and they're like no i don't want that to happen no, okay so exactly. you don't yeah, agree yeah. and that is not a plus yeah, one yeah. you get so on the positive side for make a plan um looking at it, it's in a four column layout page it's only one and a half columns on the slightly negative side this is on the uh, what is called the zombie moves play sheet. So that's kind of terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so we basically break up the moves between the basic moves and the zombie moves. And the, the basic moves are usually between survivors, and we have the zombie move sheet for the stuff that generally involves, like, zombies. And make a plan usually involves zombies because you're doing it outside of the enclave. It's not it's not for inside the enclave. Um, I mean... Oh, that's... That's clever. I like that. I like that breakdown. That makes sense. For me, I would say my favorite move is also on the zombie move sheet, although the, the basic moves are awesome, which is uh, all of the sort of moves for dealing with swarms of zombies. So you can fight the dead, fool the dead, and flee the dead. And one of the reasons I love these moves is they say very specifically, when you try to fight a swarm of zombies or fool a swarm of zombies. And we use that phrase very specifically because in zombie world, a swarm is different than one or two zombies. See, we don't want you to fight one or two zombies. You are a human and they're one or two zombies. They die. If you run away from them, they can't catch you, right? So what we're doing in a kind of classic apocalypse world sense is saying there are lots of things that aren't uncertain and therefore don't require moves. But these things are uncertain. When there's a swarm of them, fighting them means that there's risk. If it's bigger than a swarm, you don't roll for that either, but for a very different reason. You can't fight a horde. Like, what do you? there's 500 zombies. What do you do? Right? <laughs> So the goal of these swarm of zombies moves is to give us this moment of uncertainty that we see again and again and again in zombie fiction. There are only 20 zombies. You could probably fight your way through that, right? It's fine. It's fine. Um, And so we're trying to encourage players to think like zombie survivors think. One or two, no problem. 10 to 40, I could maybe do it. 50 plus, fuck this. (laughs) Like, I'm dead if I do anything but run. That's super clever. I remember in Shotgun Diaries, a zombie survival game by John Wick, which is a great little game in 18 pages. He he talks about that. Like, yeah, don't don't worry about rolling dice. It's one or two zombies. And you watch The Walking Dead, right? That's not even a thing. Like, they sneeze and they whip up. Even Shaun of the Dead, a cricket bag, gets one or two zombies. No big deal. So I, I like that call. Like, it would be pretty ignominious to go down to just the one biter. Exactly. Suck. Yep. Although, in that same context, part of what we do with these moves is exactly what Mark said. We're trying to make you pay attention to the moments that are uncertain. And that means we get to play a little bit. So, for instance, we have the move, dispose of the newly deceased. And that's our way of saying that if a person dies... Trying to do something with the body is inherently dangerous. There is some complicated element to it. There is some thing that can go horribly, horribly wrong every time. And and the number of times I've seen players realize that moment of, cool, all right. So we just took down this guy. He was a danger to our whole enclave. He was going to do some crazy stunt, open our gates. So we killed him. And I'm like, cool. So what are you doing with the body? Like, what? We burn it or something. All right. All right. Make the move. You got it. Like, wait, there's a move for that? Uh Yeah, man. Like, it's a dead body. You want to touch it? (laughs) You want to handle it? Like, who's going to take out the laundry, man? Who's going to take out the trash? This is is hard work. (laughs) That's that's vicious. Nice. Well, I think it points to, for us, like, we're not, like, you know, we don't own every zombie movie in the catalog and love the gore and the horror of it. Zombies are awesome, not because, I mean, they're cool and fun and interesting, but, like, what they really represent is a world that's turned against you. Right. That's that's the core of it. And we're really inspired by articles about like, you know, there's this great article. I forget the name of it, but about how The Walking Dead is one of the best representations of the Native American experience, because the Native American experience is all of a sudden your world went through an apocalypse and you live in that time after where the world was ripped apart. 
And for us, like the zombies represent this ripping apart that's happening as we speak, as the world is is even more hungry than it was yesterday. Um, and so a lot of these moves are pointed at that idea that the zombies are not interesting to fight. They're not fun to go around and kill one by one. They are a constant gnawing problem on your life and your ability to build something from this point forward. Nice. Oh, you got me pretty hyped here. <laughs> I have to say, if if you got a minute, I would love to act under fire and see if uh, if we can make it through Zombie World. Yeah, that huh? sounds great, man. Good luck. <laughs> it is time to act under fire. All right, in Act Under Fire, we get an opportunity to see a little bit of actual play, see the game in action. Cool. All right, so uh, our enclave is St. Joseph's Hospital. And St. Joseph's Hospital uh, has a scarcity of security, weapons, and food. So they're having a good time. Womp womp. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It has a major mall. And a power plant, specifically a hydroelectric dam power plant in the nearby area. Mm -hmm. Its population members include a group of surviving patients from the hospital, an expert doctor, uh, like a surgeon who's used to being able to use advanced and complicated equipment that's no longer really accessible, and a small group of police. And the... (laughs) A thousand good idea. Yeah, who who picked that one, Rich? Uh... (laughs) And the advantages of St. Joseph's include a quarantine, so an area of the hospital that is fairly well sectioned off. You can throw things in there and be relatively confident they won't get out. And generators. The hospital has its own functioning gas power generators. Sure, you have to keep getting more fuel for them, but the place has power, unlike so many other places in the area. Also, it, it runs on blood, right? That the yes. generator runs yes. on. Yes, <laughs> absolutely right. Yes, only the blood of children. Rich. You, you must oh. sacrifice one per session. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Well, I am going to be playing Plussy, our signature <laughs> character. I just hope that he survives. Uh, I've got a really dope pass for this Plussy, which may or may not come. I'll, I may reveal it at the end, just because I'm pretty excited about it. I have two presents. That I can choose from. It's not like Christmas. I don't get them both. The first present, and this is face up, is the first one I could choose from is lookout. Uh, when you assess a bad situation from a safe distance, draw steel instead of survival, and uh, clear one's stress when you take up a distant position, walking, watching over an ally. That's pretty cool. And the other one is scout. Uh, so take plus one survival when you scout ahead alone in advance of allies. Um, Cool. So I get to clear stress if I scout. And I'm a solo, so maybe I'll do that a lot. (laughs) I I think I'm going to choose with that. So I will just go ahead and uh, take the scout card. And now I'm going to look at my trauma. And oh, oh goodness. (laughs) So we don't know what you have for your trauma in your past. We can't see it right Mm -hmm. now. We're, We're flying blind. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. I've got my uh, character, so I'm playing Plussy. And uh, Plussy has a a savagery of one, a soul of two, a steel of three, and a survival of two. And that's the number of cards that I can draw if the move uh, applies. Right. That's right. And I'm a scout. And so one thing, uh, because you're a scout... Presents start face up. Everybody knows who you are, what you've been doing for the Enclave. You immediately get their effects. And so the first effect of Scout is take plus one survival. Cool. Well, I'll just apply that right now. That's pretty dope. So in addition to your background, you also get a survivor ally. The survivor ally this uh, comes from the population deck. So we've kind of loaded it with a bunch of interesting folks. So I'm going to give you one of them. And then we're going to talk about what your relationship is with this person. And the most important thing is this is not someone who is you know, nervous about you or worried about you. This is a person that trusts you. They believe in you and you have a strong relationship. <laughs> you, you've dealt me Sally Nelson, the stay-at-home mom. <laughs> yep. So she's got skills in empathy, manipulation, and leadership. And her equipment. Yeah, what's her equipment, Brendan? Uh, she's got a cast iron skillet, a taser, and a bag. <laughs> and a bag. So tell me, Plessy, how did you and Sally end up at the hospital together? I actually saw Sally running out of her home. 
very, very early on, and the two of us have been traveling together for a while. We came up on the hospital pretty recently. That's great. And uh, this, is, this has been a pretty great so far. So what has Sally told you happened to her family? Uh, she, she told me that her husband became one of them, and she, she came home after going out to the grocery store and found him eating their child. Oof. So you 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 you've gotten pretty close with her. She's she's able to be honest with you. Yeah. Great. Okay. Cool. At this point, you've got your past, present, and trauma. You've got a population card, and we're pretty much ready to go. If we had other players, we would take a step and we would do relationships between you and them, sort of spice up your connections to the other characters and create some stuff that's happened before we start play. But for us today, we're just going to jump right in. Sounds good. All right. So the first thing we would do is we're going to draw a fate card that then tells us what most recently has happened. We would use these during play whenever time passes to just introduce a random event and always to start the action. Uh, so for us today, our fate card will be an advantage breaks down. So it's the relatively early morning. Uh, you know, the sunlight is rising up and starting to pierce through some of the windows on the one side of the hospital. Uh, and since you don't have a scarcity of privacy, it means probably everybody has their own room. They've taken these hospital rooms and converted them into essentially small dorm rooms. Uh, so people don't have to clump together. It's actually, at least in that perspective, kind of nice. Um, however, as the sun rises, there is a noise that comes with it. Um, and it's faint at first for everybody in their myriad rooms, but it gets a little louder and a little louder and a little louder, almost as the light continues to fill each room. And eventually, those closest to it put together what this noise is. A moaning, a low, ongoing groan, along with the shuffle of mangled feet. Uh, uh not, not good, um... Once I hear about that, I'm going to go in and first of all and check on Sally, make sure she's awake, get her up, get her cast iron skillet or taser her bag. <laughs> that, is, that is the kind of sound that you need to go soon, I'm afraid. Are you and Sally in the same room? I think we're adjacent to each other. Got it. So you you dash outside the room and, and go to hers. And even in that small moment that you go into the hallway, there are other people from the Enclave coming out of the hallway as well, and looking down towards the wing of the hospital where the quarantine is held. And mm -hmm. as you, for a moment, just look, and along with everybody else, you know, Maya, Maya Viswan, another one of these survivors, has uh, come out of her own room, and she's staring down the hallway towards the sound. You see the first of the zombies... Uh, wearing scrubs, somebody that got put into this quarantine way back, probably shortly after the outbreak, from the look of the decay of this, this body. They come stumbling around the corner, shambling towards you, a horribly desiccated tongue hanging out of a broken jaw unhinged from the skull. And Maya seems like she knows this person. You know from before that she was a medical student here and working at the hospital, and she, she like doesn't freeze, doesn't break down, but immediately starts to like run away. Um, and she seems like she, her face is kind of hard, but she's clearly emotional. What do you do? Okay. Come on, Sally. It's just one. We, we got to see how bad this is. I'm going to advance and uh, I think I'm going to try to engage. It's just one zombie. It's just one. Yeah. So Sally, I mean, she's, she's with you. Like she trusts you. You've been through a lot together. Um, so she kind of looks after uh, the medical student who's who's you know moving fast away and and follows you towards towards the zombie. All right. Uh, do I have any equipment myself? Well, your hospital has a scarcity of weapons. Oh yeah. So normally it might be reasonable for you to be like, sure, I, I'm armed, but it's a scarcity for okay. St. Joseph's. It's it's at a premium. So I mean, maybe you have some kind of improvised hand-to-hand -hand kind of thing, but 
guns would be pretty rare and most likely in the hands of that small group of police that you have living with you. You might pick up like a like a bedpan or something that you could hit somebody in the head with. Yeah. That sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call out for the police. Uh, uh, there's one guy who calls himself the sheriff and I'll, I'll scream for the sheriff and, and maybe we'll I'll grab that bedpan up and I'll be thinking more defensively rather than moving on this thing but try to Call on the police and see if maybe they'll they'll come in and take care of this. That seems wise. What's your relationship with him like? <sighs> Sheriff, well, he's kind of young, and uh, I don't I don't really like the way he talks about his <laughs> position. Like it gives sure. him some kind of right to make decisions for us. But right now, I'm, I'm, I'm he can make some decisions. Cool. So yeah. So <laughs> so I would say you're probably asking an NPC for help here. So why don't you read that move for us off the basic move sheet? When you ask a friendly or neutral NPC for help, draw a soul. On a triumph, they'll do what you want if you give them a bribe or motive. On an edge, the GM will tell you what it'll take to get the NPC to do what you want. Do it and they will. So it's important here that he's not already hostile to you, right? Hostile NPCs, you can't ask them for help. They're just going to tell you to screw off, right? So the fact that as you call down the hall for the sheriff that he knows you, he's okay with you, he'll listen to you. We'll see what happens. Well, then I get to roll... Draw. With soul, I get to draw soul. I'm oh, sorry. I, just, I, want to, I want to roll. Okay, uh, I have a two of soul. So, drawing two. Two cards, all right. So, Rich, you got a miss and an edge. So, you get to take the best of those cards, and obviously you'll take okay. the edge, right? Uh, you don't want to take I will it. take the edge. <laughs> wise, wise plusy, right? Uh, cool. So, on an edge... Uh, the move tells us uh, that you, the, the GM, will tell you what it'll take the NPC to do what you want. Do it, and they will. So I think that the sheriff, uh, he likes to hold back a little bit and remind people exactly what they have to go through if he wasn't around. So I think you're going to need <sighs> to go and do a little groveling sort of face-to-face with him. Uh, you know him and his guys are probably having breakfast. They have this little, like, sort of half-functioning kitchen with the cafeteria. Whatever little food there is, they've kind of laid their hands on it. So you might have to hightail it down the hall a bit and get his attention face to face. Okay, come on, Sally, and then I, that's what I'll do. I'll I'll book it down to the cafeteria, the makeshift cafeteria, uh, bust in and and try to find Cher. Great, yeah. hey Cher. Yeah, you you come in and him and his guys are sitting there. They they have you know they they kind of wear a little bit of their uniform, whatever they still kind of kind of works. Maybe it's just a hat or a jacket or whatever. But they try to look a little official. And yeah, he's he's sitting there and he's in pretty good shape. Like he's not he's not sort of like this, you know, sort of southern uh stereotype of the sheriff, right? He's actually like like a pretty buff dude, ready to ready to take action. And when he sees you come in, he kinda looks up from his what looks like oatmeal and kind of raises an eyebrow at you. What? Sorry to interrupt breakfast. Listen, guys, the quarantine's broken down. There's there's one of the you know, one of them here on our level just just came through they all have this kind of patient relaxed kind of disinterest sheriff stands up well how many just one right now um, i mean but I, I don't have anything but a bedpan i need your help he kind of looks back at the other three or four guys and they sort of smile there's just one he says just one right just, just one right now R- right now there's one Look, Please. if you need my help, just say so. But it seems like you could probably take care of it yourself, right? I mean, you've already got that, and he kind of gestures. And one of the cops can't help but, like, snicker at that. I look down at the bedpan. It's clean, but still. Please, I, we need your help just to make sure that there isn't something worse. He laughs, like, okay. That last please was, was apparently enough for him. <sighs> So he look at Sally. That kid sucks. <laughs> she looks angry. Like she cannot believe that this was his reaction. Like this is just beyond the pale. And she doesn't say anything yet as he and a couple of his guys get up. And they, of course, take the lead back up to your ward. You're following them. But on the way back up the stairs, they're moving pretty slowly, still at that relaxed pace, like they're not worried about a thing. And Sally leans over and says, this is not okay. We need to do something. They're in the front now. 
I mean, yeah, we need to figure out how bad this is. No, you don't. You don't want to get it. They they have the guns. Like, what if what if he'd said no? What if he'd said no? She's getting increasingly loud about it too. Like when she says, "What if they said no?" One of the cops actually turns around and looks and kind of makes a face at her, like. Shut up, right? But he doesn't say anything yet. But she's kind of getting more persistent and louder about it. Okay, I'm going to take Sally by the arms. I'm not trying to hurt her, but I'm trying to get her attention. I, I really need her to chill out here because we can have this conversation once that thing's dead. Well, dead, dead, like it's not really dead. <laughs> Great. So that sounds like you're trying to calm her down, right? Yeah, yeah totally. So yeah. when you try to calm down an NPC with logic or reason, that you told her, like, we can talk about this later, right? Like, this is... Yeah, yeah, no yeah. I, I, I pull her aside and move her aside, like, maybe to towards the closet. I say, listen, we can have this conversation once that thing's down. Right now, they're just looking for an excuse to make us need them more. Right, great. So you're going to draw with steel. And on a hit, this person, whoever you're calming down, Sally, in this case, won't do anything drastic, at least for now. And on a triumph, you get to pick two, and then you get to pick one. So there's some options for for how she gets calmed down. So let's go ahead and uh, and have you draw two cards. Oh, no. I get oh, sorry, three cards. I'm, quite, I'm steely. Steely. Nice. You're tough. Three cards. Your best card oh, is? I, I do believe that one of those appears to be a triumph. A triumph. Right. <laughs> so Sally, I mean, like when you when you say this, she's immediately like, oh, of course, yeah. No, like, I get it. What do you pick for your two options? They keep calm for some time. And they reveal their true concerns. Right. So Sally says, like, like she as as you kind of you kind of pull her in, right? She says, "Yeah, no, I I understand. It's just this isn't the old world. Whatever job these guys had, it doesn't exist anymore. I don't have a family, and they don't get to wear a badge. And one day they're going to stop wearing the badges. They're just going to expect us to follow. And when she says that, like." She does hold you responsible, right? And you can see that she actually kind of pushes away from you a little bit and and kind of moves back into her room to leave you alone and, and almost indicates like not to follow her. She gives you kind of a cold shoulder because mm-hmm. you haven't done a damn thing to keep that from escalating in this in this situation. Now, as you sort of see her push away from you, you see that the cops have found the zombie. Like he's kind of stumbling down the hall. And one of them, who you know used to work at the hospital, like he taught, that's maybe he's the reason that they knew the hospital was here and might be safe, says, holy shit, is that Mike? Dude, this is Vasan's boyfriend. And he actually kicks the zombie in the chest and knocks him to the ground. And he shouts, dude, dude, get it, go get that rope I had. Let's put this thing on a leash. And you see that they have no intention of killing that zombie. What do you do? I come up from behind. Hey, Sheriff, I thought we had... We, we can't just have one of these on a leash. Come on, just, it's dead. Well, put, well, put it down. We said we would deal with the situation, and that's what we're going to do. The zombie's not going to cause any trouble for anybody. You have nothing to worry your little head about. You see the other cop coming back with the rope. Right, yeah. What do you do? <sighs> Sheriff, this, this isn't going to work. Come on, let's take it down. We can't have... Uh, uh, this kind of I'm sorry, son. Are you are you telling me what is and is not going to work? He kind of leans over you a little bit, maybe even like puts a finger in your chest, like you? You? <sighs> One of the other guys has they they're holding down the zombie by their shoulders and get the rope around its neck and it's kind of chewing at them like yep. ow, ow, ow. we can't get close. Just give me something, I'll do it. I won't waste a bullet. No, I don't think he will. See, I, my boys, they've been a little stressed keeping this whole place safe. All of you helpless people needing us all the time. We need some way to blow off steam, and this seems perfectly good. We're not hurting anybody. He pushes past you. Like, he just straight up cold shoulders you again, right? Like, just in, in sort of a, an ironic foil to Sally, right? Um, if you want to get them to stop, you're going to need to push a little harder, I think. Um, you might get in someone's face, or you might try to take some sort of action that might avert disaster. But I think at this point, they're going to grab that zombie and go have some fun with it. I think I'm going to try to grab a weapon and take it down myself. Oh, awesome. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, read Avert Disaster for us. When you try to avert disaster, say what you're trying to prevent and draw survival. On a triumph, you manage it. On an edge, you pull through, but it's going to cost you. The GM will offer you a hard bargain, ugly choice, or pyrrhic victory. So this is basically you're grabbing a gun out of one of their belts and shooting the zombie? 
Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, draw it. Let's let's draw it. That's great. So again, here, right? Like on a triumph, you're going to manage it. You might still have some consequences because you push them pretty hard, mm -hmm. right? So it's not it's not just uh, just hey, it works out and everything's great because you've got a triumph. Uh, but you will make sure that zombie is dead. Uh, how how much? What's your survival? My survival because I'm a scout is a three. Damn, yeah. you're pretty quick. Oh. Uh, I what what is this thing this opportunity what's that so an opportunity is when you draw a card that has the potential to become a triumph if you mark a stress otherwise it's a miss so it's basically like ah. you have the opportunity to seize a triumph here if you are willing to mark a stress but I also have a triumph so, you're so I'll take that instead <laughs> yep. if you only had the opportunity then you might want to pay the stress which is perfect right sure so, like, a gun out of a cop's belt was pretty stressful but you're quick man you grab it and the cop doesn't even notice you did it like he's just laughing and one of the other cops sees you raise the gun and before he can say anything it just goes off like boom in the hallway it's super loud and the zombie's brains splatter all over the floor nice and then I I have my finger in the trigger guard like I hand it back to them, hand it back to that <laughs> that cop. There you, there you go. Like he didn't even realize you had it. Like he's like, "What the?" F and he takes it from you, kind of sheepishly. And there's a minute where they look between each other, kind of bewildered. And then one of them, this look of just anger, comes across his face, and he gets right up in your face, screams at you. You don't ever fucking do that. He pushes you and shoves you back up against a wall, and he just follows you right back into that wall, continuing to scream into your face. And anytime you move, he just pushes you again. What do you do? So here's what I do. When he shoves me up against the wall, th there's a moment where I shift from trying to keep it cool, trying to play it nice, to where I, I raise my hands up. And I normally don't, I don't put my hands up, but you see these scars on my knuckles. Like a lot of little crisscross white scars. I reveal my past as a prize fighter. Oh man, really? <laughs> yes, yes. I was, a, I was a, you know, like one of the lightweight guys, right? You know, I wasn't some big bruiser, but uh, I will flip that card. I was a prize fighter. That's amazing. So, yeah, so I reveal this card, show your hidden scars and injuries to another survivor. That's great. So what's the benefit of this card? Well, the benefit is that uh, when I suffer serious harm, I draw a plus one. But it just seemed kind of neat because I'm going to actually whip on this. So guy. that's perfect. Let's turn to violence, and that'll be uh, that'll be a great place for us to probably stop. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so when you turn to violence in in zombie world, like you you have to care a little bit not only about succeeding at the violence, but also avoiding collateral damage. There's a lot of times where like a gun can shoot so the wrong person, or you might crash into something and really injure someone. So, uh, so let's see what you're able to do here. Uh, when you turn to violence against the uninfected, draw savagery on a hit, trade harm, and choose options on a triumph. Choose three, and an edge choose two. So, uh, what's your savagery? My savagery is terrible. It's a one. Like I said, I'm not. I'm not a big bruiser. I'm a prize fighter, but mostly for my speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're tough to hurt, right? Because when you get in the I fight, am. you can take a punch. I can indeed. Great. All right. One card. And that is an edge. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. So you you get to pick two off the list. What do you like? I'm really trying to make my point, so I'm not going to inflict terrible harm. Yeah, because that's I'm like, going to suffer like grab little harm. Yeah. Like maybe cave in his skull in, right? That's yeah. serious. Right. That doesn't that doesn't work for yeah. me. So I think what I'm going to do is. I'm, I'm okay marking stress, so I'm going to suffer a little harm and avoid collateral damage. Perfect. So I think you, in classic prize fighter fashion, you actually push him. He brings his hand up to swing. You just move perfectly out of the way, hit him once in the stomach, and then again right in the nose. And he just stumbles backwards into the wall and, like, dazed and bloody, but, like, schoolyard fight dazed and bloody, slides down the wall, and the sheriff starts clapping. Holy shit, son. And he puts his arm around you. And he's like, where'd that, where'd that come from? Right? And he, he just almost like brings you in as he leaves the guy, Marty, up against the wall, sort of dazed, and almost motions for everybody else to come with him and starts to walk you back to the cafeteria. And he says, Bob, we still got a couple of those oatmeal packets, right? My boy here just put up a good fight. And he, Plus, he, where'd you learn to do that? Man, that's... That's, is that where we stop? <laughs> well, what do you say? Let's stop. What do you say? Like, would you say anything? Do you pull away from him? I mean, he'll let you go. No, no, I really do want some oatmeal. I didn't eat. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's he's putting it on the table. He's ready. Back in the day, I used to 
I used to fight. You know, not, nothing big, just high school gyms and, you know, it was like the state championship for a year. But that was a long time ago. He starts laughing like, just, just, just a bit, huh, son? And as he walks you backwards, you catch out of the corner of your eye, Sally, who pokes her head out from the room. And you see her kind of shake her head and step back inside. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, my goodness, guys. Oh, poor Plessy. <laughs> oh, sucked, sucked in by those evil cops. Oh. Yeah, perfect, man. Thank you. Guys, thank you so much uh, for coming on and uh, giving me a taste of Zombie World, talking to me about it. Real quick, for people who may jump on and check out the Kickstarter, anything specific you want to highlight about the Kickstarter? So first, the first thing is that one of the things we love about this game is it's a game in a box, meaning when you get it, you're going to have everything in the box, including a dry erase marker, character sheets, everything. So if you've ever been at a convention or over at your friend's house and you've thought, I totally want to play Apocalypse World, but I don't want to spend 20 minutes printing everything at the stranger's house. Everything is in the box already. The cards, the player stuff, everything. So you just pop it open and play. Um, and that for us is one of the reasons we moved to cards and one of the reasons that we're excited about this project. Nice. And uh, the other thing would be that even now we already have plans for two additional expansions which are going to give you a ton more options a ton more past presence traumas for your characters to just increase the variety there new relationships new advantages you can earn during play new enclaves and that's what our stretch goals are doing too unlocking still further such options like a new population card for the deck and a whole brand new enclave for that traveling group of cars all over the place so by the end of this you're going to have a tremendous array of options even just on the cards you start with and if you back we have a printed play where you can grab it and cut you know cut up the the sheets and play at home and see what it's like before the cards get here um, and we're excited to get feedback from folks obviously on moves and how they're working and stuff so please come back come be a part of this and we're really excited to have the stretch goal card be like this fun thing we're not going to offer them for sale outside of like our convention at a booth right so if you're part of the kickstarter you're going to get this big batch of fun cards that are kind of a unique uh one once in a lifetime kind of opportunity to get these these particular cards Ooh, scarcity <laughs> i like it well mark brendan thank you both so much for coming on plus one forward and sharing uh zombie world with us Thanks, man. I'm glad Plessy lived another day. <laughs> Poor guy's been through a lot. Yeah, not emotionally, <laughs> but physically. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community Richard Rogers and Rach Schalke. You can find us at gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at at plus one FWD. If you would like to support our show, visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash gauntlet. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Aural Hotbed CD, Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko, Metal Version, and Drowning Attitude. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Aural Hotbed on their website, www.savagearlhotbed.com. Thank <laughs> you.